I'm uh, Bob Shank. Hey, uh, what a delight it is for me to tell you that 90% um, of the seats on the one bus trip to Israel happening in October already filled four spots left. Uh, if We've had two trips in the last four years, um, and uh, the one coming up in October, let me just tell you the best thing I do. If you were, have been on one of those two prior trips, stand up right now, wave an arm. St uh, stand up, yeah, wave an arm. Uh, these are the folks you want to grab before you leave tonight and ask them uh, would they go again because this is a missions trip set against the backdrop of God's land in Israel. It is unique. I've got a lot of friends who um, take trips to Israel, and for them it's how many buses can we take and how many hours can we make them listen to us preach. And uh, this is not that. Uh, if you'd like to go and get a great understanding of what God did 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago and what he's doing right now, and meet people who are advancing the kingdom right now in Israel. This is a trip that you do not want to miss. And if you're ever going to go, this is your chance. 32 years ago, a mentor in my life, Dr. Howard Hendricks, was the basis upon which a new relationship came into my life. It was Dr. Bruce Wilkinson. And I will just tell you tonight that it was 32 years ago that two things happened for me. One. Uh, through Bruce, God taught me how to teach the Bible for transformation. And then from Bruce, I began to discover that there were things that God had in his word that hadn't come up on Sunday. And that some of the things that God wanted to transform our lives um, hadn't come up in our American evangelical Bible learning environments. And for 32 years, uh, Bruce has been a dear friend, a brother, a uh, colleague, and a source of great inspiration and model for me. And Bruce, let me just say to you, um, your fruit grows on my tree, and you're looking in this room at a whole bunch of people who wouldn't be here if it had not been for you. Would you welcome my dear friend, Bruce Wilkinson? Great being with Bob Shank and his wife. Uh, their work in Africa has always been an inspiration to me. And then my good friend Becky is here enjoying dinner with her and Jim. And I know a few of you are in this room. And uh, I remember when Bob started talking about this idea of a Barnabas group. And uh, lo and behold, I just spoke in San Diego with some of the other speakers and uh, now here tonight to see the dream come true. So I have two times to speak to you tonight, and neither time I'll be taking an offering, so you can just relax there. <laughs> I praise the Lord. <laughs> this is a, a time for a few minutes just to minister to you, then later on I'll, I'll share a little bit before you leave about what we're doing in ministry. So I decided to speak on the topic, what would, what would Barnabas say uh, to the Barnabas group today? And so he's here today. Heaven outlawed ties a long time ago. It, it did, it did. It just, you know, just. I'm delighted there's a group meeting here that's named after me, Barnabas. For a long time, I thought everything was going to be named after Jabez. <laughs> so I'm glad at least there's one group. I've been dwelling in heaven for more than 2,000 years. It's nothing what I was expecting. And I was good friends with Paul, and he'd been here, but he didn't tell me. He was not permitted to tell me 90% of what I would find out that was the deal with God in heaven. It's one of the reasons he had that thorn. When I got here, I, I was blown away. And because you guys are named after me, I thought I would share. Heaven's going to be a shock. I haven't sung in heaven for two months. I have never played a harp that I'm in heaven. 
Heaven makes earth look like slow motion. I mean, there are, you know, seraphim and cherubim and <laughs> four living creatures. Oh my goodness, wait till you see them up close. And there's principalities and then there's rulers and there's host in the wickedness places. Then there's dominion, then there's angels and there's watchers. And there's lots of other beings I'm not permitted to talk to you about. That will blow your mind when you see what God's been doing all these millennium. Well, what takes place in heaven is exactly the opposite of what I thought would take place in heaven. You know, I thought we would just sing and praise God all the time. But, you know, Jesus kind of whispered about that wasn't the truth when he was in this debate, you know, with the, the Pharisees and the elders and, <coughs> excuse me, they were attacking him because he worked on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, wait a minute, up, up until now, I have been working and my father has been working. And he revealed the truth about heaven. That on the Sabbath, God the father was working. In fact, up until that day, the father has been working. I know he rested on the seventh day, but he's been busy ever since then. God the father does not sleep, nor does he slumber. And believe it or not, what he does is he works. Because there are hundreds of millions of angels and spirit beings that are sent out on assignments and all different kinds of hierarchies that will blow your mind. I mean, the organization of heaven is astonishing. And people are super productive in heaven. Well, at least the people who are given the right to be productive in heaven. <laughs> Man, is that just a shocker. So what I want to do is to share with you three secrets from my perspective of being there in heaven. Because there's a mass confusion on earth, and there was confusion in my life, even with Paul. Paul wasn't confused, and that's the way. He was so clear because he had seen how heaven operates and how what happens on earth determines what happens to you in heaven. And he wrote about it a few different places, and Jesus talked about it quite a bit. But there's this mass confusion. We don't understand that our life continues. It continues. It's not two different lives. You know, you, you can't see me. I can't see you. Because when I die, I leave this house that I've been in for 70 years now. I leave it. This is not me. This is where I dwell. And when I die, I just move. And it doesn't, I don't spend a long period of time moving. I move this quickly. I'm in the body and I'm out of the body. When I'm out of the body, I, I really am who I am. I'm a spirit being and so are you. You're a spirit being that has a soul that lives in a body. And eventually you'll have a new body. But your, your essence, and it's called your morphe, that's what's going to be forever. That is what's forever. And what happens to you in heaven is dependent upon what you did here. This is a big testing ground. This is the proving ground for forever. You're here to find, for Jesus to find out well, I'm ahead of my story a little bit. I'm getting a little warmed up, but we're going to get into it. I, I wish that I knew back then what I know now about how heaven works. Because I thought back then, the only thing you got to worry about is getting in. And if you get in, then you're all set. But I didn't understand that that is not at all how it works. Getting in is just the beginning point. It's like the door opens and you're permitted to enter into heaven, but heaven is a place. It's a place, just like earth is a place. But nobody on earth is the same as anybody else on earth and how you live and what you do and how much money you have and how much authority you have. You've earned those things unless you inherited them from a wealthy parent or something. Heaven is the same way. 
It's one thing to get into the place called heaven, but what happens when you get here has everything to do with what Christ evaluates how you did on the test, the proving ground. So the entrance into heaven is because somebody else opened the door for you. Jesus Christ paid for our sins by the shed blood and his resurrection. And that, in a sense, solved the problem because the door is closed because of sin. And it has nothing to do with what I do for God or not do for God. The door opened because somebody opened it. And if I put my faith in Christ, that door is open for me because of what somebody else did. That gets me into the place. So the big point that shocked me in heaven is once I'm there, whoa! Everything that happens to me is because of what I did here. And I didn't really get that clear. Wow. I want to talk to you about three determiners. What, what I do now determines what my forever life will be on the other side. And the first determiner is who I become in my life here, my character. How much like Jesus I become. I don't think you know that when you die, you do not change. The you remains you. People think that when they die, they turn into Jesus. They don't. <laughs> they don't. I'm still Barnabas. And I have some strengths and I have some weaknesses. The only difference between heaven and here is I don't sin anymore. And I don't have a sin nature anymore. But I'm still Barnabas. And once you come out of, once you come out of earth, who you are at that instant is who you're going to be forever. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I don't know if you understand that you are... Um, your, e your essence is made up of light. The Bible calls that light glory. Jesus is full of glory. And that glory is determined, the amount of the glory, how glorious a being you are, is determined by if you became like Christ. The more you are like Christ, who is the glorious one, the more glory you become. You, you can't see me. I can't see you. And if the Lord ever let us see each other, some of you are so glorious, it, it would almost blind us and we would be tempted like the Apostle John did to bow down in front of a, an angel because he was so... That's right. What, is, what are you? You're a glorious being. You're a glorious spirit being. How glorious you are, how brilliant you are, what hue you are is completely dependent upon you. Daniel talked about this. I met Daniel, spent a lot of time with him. It took a long time for him to explain Daniel 9 and 11 for me. I was very slow to learn that thing. And he said this, listen to it. He said, those who are wise shall shine, shall shine, how much? Like the brightness of the firmament. Those who are wise will do this. And those who turn many to righteousness, those who turn many to righteousness, shall shine, listen to the words, like the stars. Kahoo! The stars. <laughs> For how long? Forever and ever. You've got to understand, this is eternal. How brilliant you become before you die is how brilliant you'll remain forever. And you're going you're gonna, <laughs> to, you don't want to have a little bit of glory forever. Because that's how you'll be seen and known, because that is you. And you had the same chance that everybody else did to be conformed into Jesus Christ. You remember one at the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was there with some of the disciples and God the Father permitted some of the glory of Jesus to come out of Jesus? 
That's that word transfiguration. Transfiguration comes from the Greek word metamorphosis, morphos. Morphos, your morphe. And the Bible talks about in Corinthians, we are being changed. You know how this passage goes? Some of you do. From glory to glory. And it's being translated from one level of glory to another level of glory into the same image, which is Jesus. You've got to understand, your glory gets changed to the degree in which you become like Christ before you die. And then it's fixed forever and ever. You're being transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And the Bible gives a secret about how this translation, this tr metamorphosis occurs. In Romans chapter 12, it says, For you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen carefully, because I don't have time to teach this. How does the glory grow? If you go back and you read the passage in Corinthians where it goes from glory to glory to glory, it's by reading the scriptures in that context. The veil's taken away and they can understand the Old Testament and so forth. And in Romans, it actually tells you the secret of how this occurs. You are transformed. It's a passive verb, which means you don't do the action yourself. It happens to you. That is, I cannot increase my glory. I can take action steps, and God does the action to me of increasing my glory. And that passage in Romans says, you're going to be metamorphosis, same word, transfigured by Jesus, same word, is the same concept. How, how does this happen? You're transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's how you think determines who you become. That's why if you're not reading the scriptures, oh man, alive, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind to match what God says in the scriptures. It's alive, it's powerful, it splits your soul and your spirit, it changes your glory. And if you're not in the word of God, you're a little wimp in glory. And you're not going to want to be that way. All right, that's the first big idea, you got it? I don't want Jim knocking on the wood here saying, hurry up. So the second one, what's the first one? Your character. What's it determined? The amount of your glory. What does Jesus talk about? Does he talk about salvation, the entranceway into heaven the most? Or does he talk about how to prepare for your eternity once you're in heaven the most? The answer is this side. What does Paul talk about the most? Quantity of scripture shows priority of the Godhead. And the Godhead has much more in the Bible about this side than it does about this side. This is a simple act of belief, and you are in. It's a gift that you don't do anything for, and you can't do anything because it was done 2,000 years ago. But on the basis of that, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? This has as much eternal consequence as salvation does. This gets you into a place. This determines what happens to you when you're in the place forever. What are you going to want to do when you get into heaven? You're going to want to be like Christ, and you're going to want to rule with him. When Jesus Christ wanted to reward the people who served him the most, his apostles, he gave them the highest reward you could possibly earn, rulership. Rulership in heaven is earned. And it's earned by how productive you are for Christ. Of taking Christ's goals and objectives and being incredibly productive in achieving them with God, with God's spirit, for Christ. That is, you deny yourself. Deny yourself of what? Your own goals, which aren't wrong. To do what? <laughs> to achieve his goals. And to the degree in which you not only seek to achieve his goals, but you are incredibly productive in achieving them, is the degree in which he is going to promote you. And if you're not, if you've wasted your life and played over here with the things which aren't sinful, but just have no eternal consequence, you weren't put on this earth to do that. 
You were put on this earth to prove your faithfulness. And if you read the Gospels, Jesus defines faithfulness as the degree to which you have achieved his objectives. What's a great employee? A great employee is the person who achieves the goals of the boss and goes beyond what the boss was expecting. If you do not demonstrate that while you're here, <laughs> you, you will have lost forever the right to rule. What will you want to do when you get to heaven? You'll want to, do, you'll want to sit next to Christ. And Christ said, you have to overcome, and you'll sit on my throne with me ruling if you do. How do you overcome? You overcome yourself. You take up your cross, the things you have to suffer for, to do this for him. So be productive. Start paying attention to what you're giving away your life to. You take your three possible assets of your time, your talent, and the money that you got, put it together, and maximize Christ's objectives. When you get to heaven and you're with me, you're going to realize that's the only reason you were here, is to prove that you were loyal to Christ. How do you know you're loyal to the leader? You fulfill the leader's wishes, not your wishes. He just gives us all a free will. And the third one. <laughs> oh, dear. What happened to my tie? <laughs> I dropped the clicker. Well, <laughs> people just don't understand. Heaven's economy is astonishing. There is no communism in heaven. There is no socialism in heaven. God always has been about personal ownership since creation. And God's economy there, Paul wrote about it. He said, listen, you better prepare yourself and through good works, through giving, through sharing, listen to these words as I close, lay up a good foundation for the aged to come. The age to come is where you're going to live forever. And Paul's teaching, you have to lay a foundation for this life so that you can lay a hold of the quality of eternal life. This is what Jesus Christ meant when he said, you have to lose your life here to find it here. You have to set aside your objectives here and make him his objectives here. You have to seek it here, his, so you'll find it here. You don't find your life until the other side. It's when you get up there that you find out the consequence of abandoning things for him. Therefore, I want to encourage you as Barnabas, keep up the good work. But man, you make sure you're focused on eternity now and pass on funds. You must deposit it. Or when you get into heaven, you're going to be broke. That's why Jesus commands us he says, therefore, I command you, lay up treasure for yourself in heaven. Why would Jesus command anybody to do that if you didn't need treasure in heaven? When you enter the new world, <laughs> you have everything to determine how rich or how poor you're going to be, friends. It's not the accumulation here, it's the passing on there that is all yours. Make sure you're passing it on, hunks of it. How much? As much as you want to have for forever. And if you're only giving away a little bit here and there, you know, 10% is nothing, nothing. Oh my goodness. I asked Bruce to be challenging. <laughs> Did he do that? 